My name is Ruben Cantu. I'm a native born uh, here in Austin, Texas. I love my city. I would hate to leave it because of all these amazing people here. But today, I'm going to talk about how I've expanded and I've started thinking on a larger picture. And genius really started speaking to me several months ago. And so when I went back to my emails, and like, wait, Ben told me that they're speaking about genius in August. I'm like, I got to tell him what I found out. And so I hope you join me on this journey. Now, you know, I know that when uh, Ben approached me, he's like, genius, really? Like, <laughs> really? I was like, no, 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 seriously. And so raise your hand here if you're a genius. Pretty damn good. By the end of this talk, I'm going to see every single hand raised because of what I found out. So like me, a super data nerd, right? I want to find out everything about everything, how it was created, and why they did it this way. And so I went to find out what the word genius meant. And genius means exceptional ability, um, creative power, and exceptional intelligence. But then it hit me as like creative power. And then I was like, well, what does that mean? Where does the origin of the word come from? It comes from Latin, gignere. Gignere means to beget. To beget means to create. And if an essence, think about it, it is the attendant spirit that was placed in us from birth. So every single person here has been given a gift, a spirit from birth that is destined to help create greatness. But raise your hand here if you believe that we're all destined for greatness. Interesting. Wow. Kind of the, the room is kind of woken up. Some of them are not. But I'm going to show you why. So the IQ test has been used as the gold standard. And actually, it's two. There's actually various ones, and there's even Mensa, but we won't get into that. But the main two uh, were created to try to understand the performance of people, how well you would perform. It was never based on intelligence of like how intelligent you were. But it started becoming uh, known that, like, oh, intelligence is fixed, and you're, you're born with it, and that's what, you, that's what you're going to be for the rest of your life. And that's actually not true at all. Um, you can continue learning. You can continue to become wiser. Alfred Binet was a scientist in France, and France wanted to uh, offer free schooling for all of their children, uh, you know, all the country's children. And so they needed to understand where they can place these students and like, how, how they were going to measure them. That's where the first test became popularized. It came over to the United States roughly in the industrial age, uh, early 1900s, um, from like 19, uh, early 1910s to like 1920s, and Stanford adopted it. And so it became the Stanford University, Stanford um, Binet, or Binet, uh, actually pronounce it if I knew how to speak French, Binet, um, uh, test. And then uh, people used it, but it, it felt like there was limited aspects to it. Like in World War I, they started using this test because they wanted to see if um, soldiers were going to be able to do the task at hand to be able to win the war. And it actually worked. It was actually served this purpose. And they're like, oh my god, we should just put more, t more resources behind this. And so it became so popular that they started using it for immigration policies at Ellis Island. And they started generalizing groups of people based on this IQ test. And so if you scored lower on an IQ test, like certain groups of people, we, you know, I think it was like the Irish was coming into the country at that time, they were not allowed into the country, right? Like, oh no, we need a certain IQ level in our country. It was kind of a sad day for our country. And so that had its own criticism and issues. And then people continued to try to improve it. In 1955, they created this IQ test, uh, the WAISR test. And that's what m the mainstream people use nowadays. And it's supposed to uh, do a little bit better job and, and take a little bit more consideration. But here's where they all fail. And not only have they been proven to have cultural and racial bias, but they don't truly measure intelligence. Because intelligence isn't just about if you're being able to read or write or you're able to solve these tough problems. It doesn't measure the practical knowledge, what we call street smarts. It doesn't measure emotional quotient, 
right? It doesn't measure the ability for you to be able to work and talk with people. It doesn't measure what Elise just did on this stage. She's genius, right? And I, I started thinking about it. If that's not the case, then every single person is born with this spirit, and that's a gift. And our number one role in life is to find out why we were placed on this earth. Raise your hand if you agree with me on that. Our number one job is to find out why we were placed on this earth. And once we find that out, once we find that gift, our second most important job is to share it with the world. Because we all depend on one another. And so it started, that started down the path of like, whoa, so the, if everyone has a gift, and if everyone works on their gift, they can become great at that gift because no matter over time, you work on your gift, you become great at it, right? You, you can't tell me by spending 10,000 hours on doing something you love to do, you can't become great at it. It's, it's scientifically proven, right? And so I then started asking myself, what the heck is a gift? And how does that differ from a talent? Does anyone want to help me here and answer, what is the difference between a gift and a talent? Anyone, just shout it. So Melanie said, gifts are something you are born with. Raise your hand if you agree with that. Huh. Gifts are in truly, so if I give Ben a gift, right, he didn't necessarily deserve anything, right? But the meaning of the word gift, it says, <laughs> I love you so much that I want to give you something, right? That's a gift. A talent, on the other hand, is something that you develop over time. And so our highest work and job is to find out what our gift is. And as we develop that gift, that turns into genius because it becomes great and it becomes exceptional. And so if you truly believe that you have the potential and capacity to be great, I dare you to step out. Why? Because our natural selves is to be creative. We need to give a new definition to the word genius. Why have we let older people that created systems in the industrial age determine what we are capable of doing today? We need to find a new way to address the multitude and diversity of genius in our community, in our society. That got me thinking, what is intelligence then? This is actually pretty, it was new to me when I started thinking about it. And hopefully, if this is, maybe this is already common knowledge to you, but maybe I'm sometimes slow, so I'll give it to you. <laughs> in order for intelligence to be formed, we have to understand the origin of intelligence. The world and the universe is scattered, right? It's chaos, it's controlled chaos, I guess to a degree, right? But there's data points everywhere. So data exists no matter what. And you can find data about anything. And today in the internet age, you can find anything about anything. But data alone isn't just powerful. When you gather enough data together, you put it in formation. In formation. Information. So data becomes information. And information gives you the ability to start creating knowledge from what has been put together. From that knowledge, you then gain intelligence that gives you the ability to act on that knowledge. From that intelligence, you get wisdom, which gives you the ability to decide if you want to act on that knowledge or not. And so if you understand that trajectory and path, you'll understand your path and how it relates to creativity and genius. Let me explain something about creativity. Creativity is something that's innate in all of us, as I talked about. But what, how do people define creativity and how do people define genius? When I see what Elise did on this stage, I'm in awe. But to her, it's the easiest thing in the world. She's been, been performing for 10 years. She can he sit here and probably go another hour if she wanted to, right? And I'm thinking to myself, whoa, 
when I see a beautiful drawing or painting, when I, we go to an amazing restaurant and we taste amazing food, when we, take, when we taste fusion food, it's the collision of these two ideas that weren't put together. And for us, it seemed daunting, right? Like, how, how the heck did you put that together? To us, we call that genius, but to them, it's natural. It's my gift, right? And so the world will see certain things as impossible and call it genius when you, in fact, all you're doing is bringing and colliding together your own unique experience. As awesome as Ben is, I can never be Ben. And as awesome as everyone else is, you cannot be me. That's not our role. Our role is to be our fully actualized selves. And so in order to do that, we have to trust in ourselves. So let me tell you, let me take you on my journey. By the way, I know a lot of people have good and bad criticisms about this, but I used to work at Apple. I became a Steve Jobs fanatic. I learned everything about him. I watched every single piece of video that was ever created on him. So if you ever want to talk about quiz or stuff, like I've been known to like quote Steve Jobs at least once a day. It's annoying, I know. <laughs> Steve Jobs quotes. Um, but with that being said, okay, let me, let me see if this will play. I want to play something that didn't make sense. Just It sounded cool when I heard it, but over the past couple of years, it started making much more sense. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that calligraphy class, and personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path. And that will make all the difference. It didn't make sense. Like, what is he talking? Okay, so basically, because he took a calligraphy class, like the computers had like best calligraphy and like innovative. Okay, 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 get it. But how does that apply to me? I started realizing that certain things became came easier to me than others. Statistics say that the two biggest fears that humans have is death, and two, who knows the second one? I stand on the stage with no fear, right? And I was like, oh, hey, well, that's just because I've you know practiced and you know I've worked at it. And then I started talking to my mother, and it's like, you know, I really like this public speaking thing. I said, like, yeah, I know. I, once you started talking, you couldn't shut up. <laughs> We thought you were going to be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't defend people who like, I knew were guilty. So <laughs> thanks, mom. <laughs> she said, you know, there was an interesting story when you were four years old. I was like, what? Yeah, we were standing outside of uh, Sunday service, and the minister had seen you really cute, and you, I just bought you a new suit, a little tie, and you were walking around. And you had just already started learning about the world and like how it's put together. You had just learned about Ronald Reagan. And I was like, huh, okay, interesting. And, so, and, he, and he said, you look quite impressive, young man. What are you going to be when you grow up? I'm going to be the first president that takes care of poor people. I'm going to be the first Mexican-American president that does the right thing by people. <laughs> And I, and I asked her, like, I said that? I was like, uh, yeah, because what four-year-old talks like that? <laughs> and I said, like, why was I even talking about that? Well, you know, you were asking me, like, who the guy was on TV, and I was telling you that was Ronald Reagan, and I was like, oh. And I was like, is that the guy you were telling me earlier why the, 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 the world is the way it is right now? I was like, well, <laughs> kind of. And I was like, he's the one that you said was Reaganomics or something? It's like, yeah. It's like, I was asking about Reaganomics when I was four. And I was, I didn't know really what it meant, but basically I knew that it wasn't good for poor people. <laughs> and so uh, I was like, interesting, okay. And just, I just took that as a moment in time. But then I started remembering all those times that I would step up and speak in front of the school. And there was one particular time that I was asked to give a speech. I was 10 years old. 
I had given the speech about the journey about my parents to this country. It was a journey that, for a while, I was a little bit, I didn't want to really share. Excuse me, can you help me out? Yep. <clears throat> Dry throat. I didn't really want to share because I didn't have anything to show for it. It was the D.A.R.E. graduation speech. And in that speech, I talked about why I never want to do drugs. Now, whether you do, we're all adults, whether you do drugs or not, that's not the point. I was 10 years old, and I said, I'm never going to do drugs. <laughs> and I said, I'm never going to do drugs because I want to actually be successful in life. And I don't want to end up like other case studies that have not made it because they got sidetracked by drugs at an early age, especially knowing that my father came here at the age of 18 years old with an eighth grade education and $100 in his pocket not knowing the English language. My mother only has a high school education. And obviously, I won't give you that speech. I was 10 years old. Um, but the point of that is I got my first standing ovation. I didn't even know what that was like. And I was like, whoa, I guess it was a good job. And I was like, OK, cool. No, thought nothing of it. And then as I continued on, I kept trying to find ways to step up and be a leader and speak. And when I was 14 years old, they came to my high school and said, who wants to start a radio show? The AV Club was sponsoring it. No one at the time wants to be part of the AV Club. I was like, I'll do it. And I stuck with it. And I, I started doing radio. And I stumbled and stuttered through it. And then pretty soon, I was the only one left. And several years after that, I started my, I mean, that helped me lead and start my first company in the music industry. You could not tell the difference between my radio show and air checks, which is like the time when you go on radio and introduce the next songs, to any other commercial radio DJ. That led me to starting my video show when I was in college. And I put myself in front of the TV, and I said, this is the brand new hip hop music videos that you're going to listen to today, right? I was like, who does this guy think? I was out there interviewing Wu-Tang Clan, and like some of the, like Ludacris, and all the top, like, um, all the top like hip hop artists in the early 2000s. And it came the most natural to me. And so it forwarded me on to what I was doing with my company after I left Apple and started like, forming uh, my, my production company. And I realized that as I was giving workshops on how to do video, people were like, this is awesome. Like, you're a natural talent. And I was like, oh, thank you very much. I'm just thinking of nothing of it again. And then as I start forwarding, pushing through, I'm realizing the one thread that ends up being the most natural to me is speaking, and I never wanted to admit to it because no, I need to be a Nobel Prize winner. I need to like you know solve like global peace and do all these crazy things, and then I realized that no, you you've been given a gift, and that's just to talk, and so <laughs> it seemed like like deflating at the time, but then I realized no, that's like the most powerful thing to do is to be able to use your gift so that you can inspire people inside. And from that point on, and from the past 10 years, on an unofficial basis, I've been coaching and working, and now more officially, coaching and working with startups and individuals, and literally inspiring them and helping them, helping them untap their gifts. And it's like the most bliss and most like high that I get. Raise your hand here if you know what it's like to be in flow. Okay, flow is this state where time becomes absent. It just slips by. You are in the zone, and there's nothing you can take, that can take you out of it. Um, you actually love being there, and it's the most effortless. For someone else, like, honestly, do not ever ask me to work on a spreadsheet for you. It'll take weeks to get it done. Ask me to go and give a presentation or do a sales meeting or do something and get in front of people. We'll get that sales in a minute, right? That's just my zone. And so I realized with that process, how could I start leveraging that and start forming my genius? And it was through the ability to start leveraging storytelling and speaking. And in the last one, which is like my trifecta, my partner that stands in the back there, Coy McDermott, started a company with me, Level Up Institute. And we decided to create more first-generation college students that were becoming entrepreneurs. 
Thank you. Because I was already coaching students on my own, but this is a first a formal way of doing it. I'm telling you what I'm doing should be illegal because I got the biggest high ever. <laughs> I love teaching, but here's the ironic part. I told myself I would never be a teacher. My sister's a teacher, my cousins are teachers, my brothers, my aunts and uncles are teachers, my grandparents in Mexico were directors of elementary schools. I'm like, nope, they don't get paid well, they don't get treated well, I'm not doing that, I'm gonna go make a lot of money and be an entrepreneur and filmmaker, screw all that. <laughs> God has a way of making fun of you. I started working with these students and I'm in love. And it was through speaking and coaching and training that I found what my zone of genius is. And so I want to help you. I will allow you, I, I'm inviting you and asking you to help me find you your genius. So we're going to go through an exercise, okay? Are you with me? I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to go back and select three moments where you felt the most bliss, where you felt at the highest you've ever felt, where people were like, damn, girl, damn, man, that's awesome. How you do that? I want you to, I want you to go there. I want you to start breathing it in, smelling it again, that experience where you're at. You might have, you might have sung a great song. You might have a, uh, baked a great cake. You might have like solved a really tough problem. And these distinguishing experiences in time, start trying to see if there's a thread that connects them. Is there, a, is there an ongoing insight or pattern here that sets you apart, that's been inside of you the whole time but you've never given yourself the opportunity and love and courage to step out into your light. Raise your hand here if some of these things are coming to coalesce together. It takes time. We just spend like a minute doing it. This could take a whole weekend, right? So good. So some of you already are feeling it. Some of you are still not believing in yourself some of you are still cynical, like, man, this dude is wasting our time trying to, like, if he likes this woo-woo stuff. But no, seriously, give me an opportunity. Like, I'm asking you to believe in yourself enough to know that you are great and you are destined for greatness. And because of that, we're going to do an exercise. I want you to find your partner. Find a partner. Don't be alone. This, you cannot do this alone. If you don't have a partner, you need to find a partner and look at them. All right, so stay with me, stay with me. All right, so here's the choice. Partner one, right? The person sitting, I guess, how would we do this? Uh, the person that has the earliest birthday in the year goes first. Okay, and here's what we're gonna do. You got it? You, you, you changed it? Okay, good. I want you to look, and it sounds creepy, like, ugh, why is he asking us to do this? But hold on, give me a second. Look each other in the eyes, and the person that's, that has the earliest birthday is the one that's gonna go first. And you're gonna say to your partner, I see your genius, please share your light with the world every day. On the count of three. <laughs> on the count of three. One, ready? One. Two, I see your genius. Please share your light with the world every day, okay? I know it's weird. Follow me on this. One, two, three. I see your genius. Please share your light with the world every day. And the reason I did this is this. Why? Sometimes when we speak to ourselves, we don't believe ourselves. Sometimes we need someone else to affirm the reality that's already inside of us because we're so vulnerable. So now we're going to flip roles. And now we're going to ask the other person to say the same thing. I see your genius. Please share your light with the world every day. On a count of three. One, 
two, three. I see your genius. Please share your light with the world every day. It seemed a little woo-woo, right? It seemed a little cheesy, right? It's the start. Not everyone is going to take this step, but there's some brave people in this room who are going to step forward. I want you to close your eyes, and I'm going to ask you to do this one final thing. I need you now to believe it in yourself and say it for yourself. On the count of three, we're going to stand up, we're going to raise our fist in the air, and we're going to say, wait, we're going to say, I am a genius. Are you ready? I know it's kind of crazy. On the count of three, one, two, three. I am a genius. This is the first step. You can take a seat now. Thank you. This is the first step to untapping your genius. You have to accept it and claim it as it is your own. I cannot be you. My job is not to be you. Your job is not to be me. Your job is to be the highest version of yourself before you leave this earth, period. Unless you just believe that we're here on this earth to create red blood cells and just breathe oxygen, I think that's ludicrous. So step into your light and show the world your genius because it's not based on an intellectual quotient test that was created in the industrial age. It's based on your gift and what you give today. I need you as much as you need me, Ubuntu. Ubuntu is African. It means I am because you are. You are because I am. Together, we are one. They say if you want to go fast, go alone. But if we want to go far, go together. Thank you very much. I, sh I should have I done this before, but we just got to do a quick Insta story and just get it on, get it on there. Insta story. You missed the moment when we were standing know, up, you I know? Yeah. I was in the moment. All right. One, two, three. I am a genius. <laughs>